actually, unfortunately, that is the primary thing that I'm going to talk about is hate, because I do think that is actually what we're facing here. That's what we are fighting against. Uh, truly organized, um, truly thought out hatred, and. It's, it's a serious claim to, to say that the people that we're trying to, um, you know, that we're facing and the campaign that we're facing and trying to do something about is a campaign of hate. And that's why I do want to show you some of their own words and their own actions. I don't want to just make statements uh, without any kind of backing. So uh, I want to, I just want to show you, this was the first demonstration uh, that we had in Toronto when the camp, when the when the, this attack, this current attack uh, that Israel is conducting in Gaza happened, uh, the very first demonstration, and we got there, and I just wanted to show you, I, I had to, my eye was drawn to the counter demonstration. They were playing club music, uh, dance music, and they were dancing and they were waving these flags, and my eye was drawn to this uh, particular. Um, uh, young guy and some of the gestures that he made. Uh, so he's saying, you know, I, I, I'm going to remember your face. And then you can see him pointing to the at me. So, and these guys are celebrating, uh, you know, pointing to their crotches and whatever. I want to, it's one, you can look at a video like that and say, okay, well, that's just one thing, that's just one counter demonstration. But those of us who've been working for Palestine have been facing these, these things for years. In Toronto, the last demonstration that was on Wednesday had an even bigger presence of these uh, people. It was a well-organized disruption. They were physically aggressive with the protesters. Uh, and, um, and, and I'll talk a bit about why they're doing this not just psycho the psychology behind it, because that's less interesting to me than the politics behind it, but the politics behind it are, are I think, very specific and, and, again, thought through, deliberate, uh, and part of a campaign. Uh, this, is, um, this, is a, this is a video of a child firing a rocket-propelled grenade, uh, which, the, which the Israeli um, military and spokespeople have been circulating on the web and saying, see, we may be killing a lot of children in Gaza, but um, these children are firing rocket-propelled grenades at us. In fact, the video is from Libya. It's not got anything to do with Palestine, and it's a complete hoax. The next thing uh, that I wanted to show you was this uh, two settlers attempt to kidnap Palestinian child in Jerusalem. So um, remember the framing of the conflict in terms of the idea that Israel is this civilized uh, bastion of the West and of democracy, the only democracy in the Middle East, whereas Palestinians, Arabs, Iranians, Lebanese, the people all around them are barbaric. Uh, they committed these horrible acts of violence. This. Um, you know, this, this round of conflict actually started when some uh, a couple, uh, three teenagers, three Israeli teenagers, were kidnapped uh, in, um, in Israel, in the West Bank, I believe. No, yeah, in the West Bank, I believe. Uh, they were killed, um, and the, the Israeli government said it was Hamas that was responsible. In fact, uh, they conceded that Hamas had nothing to do with it. Hamas never said they had anything to do with it, but they used this as a as a excuse to go forward against um, Gaza. Uh, but of course, Israeli settlers, um, a, a group of Israelis, I don't think they were settlers, they attacked and murdered a, a Palestinian boy in reprisal. Uh, and now they're, they're, once again, they've attempted to kidnap other children. So there is an element of you know, aggression specifically aimed at children. And that is, you know, another, another, another link, another chant that was found by Electronic Intifada. If you look, um, they have a video of a group of Israeli uh, youths mostly chanting, school is out in Gaza, there are no more children left, 
ole ole ole. So they're sort of chanting joyfully about uh, the deaths of the children. There's a historian named Benny Morris. Uh, he's, he's one of the first historians uh, to unearth some of the history of the original uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestine that occurred in 1948. So Benny Morris is a, is, a, is a historian, a very rigorous, kind of good historian in the sense of scholarship. He went into the Israeli archives, he, he went into the original archives of the militias that carried out the operations in the villages during the creation of Israel, and he found a lot of things that, that contradicted the stories and the myths about the creation of Israel. So, the idea that Israel was forced into a lot of the wars and, the, and, and a lot of the actions that they did in 1948, well, Benny Morris found that it was, it was not, it was more by design than by war. This was one of, their, one of the slogans, was it was by war and not by design that Israel was created. Well, Benny Morris found all these, this evidence of design. So, the interesting thing about Benny Morris, and you can read about Benny Morris in, from other scholars like Ilan Pape and Norman Finkelstein, but Benny Morris says when he goes back, he says now, when he goes back and reads about the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in 1948, it makes him feel good. He, he, he feels really good about, about it, um, and he says if you want your villa in the jungle, uh, you have to do this kind of destruction. So he says, you know, what's going on in Gaza right now? It's not enough. That's what he said in, the, in these newspapers. Um, and, and this was in Haaretz on July 25th. Ilan Pape mentioned this in his, uh, in his thing. So now we get into, we've, we've discussed academics. We've, I mean, we've discussed poly, uh, yeah, academics like Benny Morris. We've discussed people in the streets of Israel and what they're chanting. We've discussed people in the streets of Toronto and what they're doing. Now we move on to political figures. So we have uh, Ayelet Shaked. This is a fairly famous thing that she said. She said, um, they, Palestinians have to die and their houses should be demolished so they cannot bear any more terrorists. They are all our enemies and their blood should be on our hands. This also applies to the mothers of the dead terrorists. They are all enemy combatants and their blood shall be on all their heads. This shall include the mothers of the martyrs who send them to hell with flowers and kisses. They should follow their sons. Uh, nothing would be more just. They should go as should the physical homes in which they raise the snakes. Otherwise, more little snakes will be raised there. So this is a politician. How much trouble did this... Pol so again, you can say this is a politician who, who said something off the cuff and, you know, she made an off the cuff kind of remark. How much trouble did she get into for making this comment? How much censure did she face? How many of her colleagues distanced themselves from her for saying this? Nobody. She didn't get in any trouble. She didn't have anybody distance themselves from her. Um, and, uh, and she's uh, still campaigning for that to this day. Uh, back to the academy, we have Mordecai Gadar at Bar Ilan University who says, uh, a terrorist like those who kidnapped the boys in the West Bank and killed them, the only thing that will deter them is if they know that either their sister or mother will be raped if they are caught. What can we do? This is the culture that we live in. So this professor who, said, who recommends rape as a policy Again, how much trouble does he get into with his university for saying such a thing? Well, the university says the purpose of this professor's comments was to define the culture of death of the terrorist organizations. Dr. Kedar illustrated in his words the bitter reality of the Middle East and the inability of a modern and law-abiding country to fight the terror of the suicide bombers. So they, the university said, you know, he was right. Um, he, wasn't, he wasn't prescribing a policy. He was just saying that maybe this would work. You know, social media is another source. Uh, Electronic Intifada, again, is watching Israeli social media. There are messages about how bombing Gaza children gives me orgasm. Uh, there, are, uh, there are people that are having picnics. This was in the New York Times as well as Haaretz uh, on Facebook, where they watch the rockets. They go and they go out on a hilltop and they watch the rockets. I mean, they watch the missiles hitting Gaza. Uh, as a, and then this is like a way to kind of blow off steam, like they're living under a lot of stress, it kind of helps them relax to look at Gaza.
being bombed. And this kind of takes us to back to Canada. So, so in the worst, from the beginning, Prime Minister Stephen Harper has been completely with Israel. The, the latest massacres that the United Nations warned, they said they warned Israel, gave them the coordinates of the school in Shujaia 17 times, uh, and the Israelis bombed them. Uh, anyway, you know, this was a place where people had gone to, to, sh to shelter and, and, uh, and they attacked it. Uh, and Stephen Harper's response was, well, we, I still blame Hamas for this. Uh, whatever happens, Israel's not to blame. Uh, the other po political parties in Canada are no better. Um, nobody has taken it. The Green Party came out with this rambling statement uh, talking about how we need to support Israel no matter what. And um, so a commentator for the Times of Israel, have people heard of this today? People hear about this? So a commentator for the Times of Israel, they published an op-ed. Uh, the guy said something like, well, our goals of safety can't be accomplished except through genocide, so I guess that's kind of where we have to go. Um, and they, the Times of Israel took it down, uh, he apologized, but I view these things as, uh, yeah, it's so taken down, you can, you can take a look, just search on this title and you'll see the whole thing happen. Um, I view these things as kind of trial balloons. So, these attacks, these kind of forays, and these kinds of rhetorical and physical things that are going on in the streets, um, on social media, they're pushing the limits of what's acceptable, they're pushing the limits of what's possible. Um, what's possible to think about, like, it's, it's impossible to think about Gaza having an airport. It's impossible to think about Gaza having a seaport where people can come and go freely, but it's possible now to think about genocide. That's possible. So that's the spectrum of thinking, is can we go back to a situation where people in Gaza are locked up in this place, starving and not being actively bombed, or from there, should we really think about genocide because that's the only way to stop the rockets or whatever the current excuse is. And when you look at statements by people like Stephen Harper, I think it's really important to, to know that the words that he's saying don't actually matter. Like, he's not thinking about what he's saying. These are just talking points that he's repeating. He doesn't, the, the self-defense, the what about the rockets, the, uh, I mean, those are the only two talking points that come to mind. Um, but a uh, degenerous ceasefire offer, or whatever the current generous offer is, that these are, these are just talking points. And when people like this go out, they're, they're, they see their job as doing whatever Israel needs them to do. Uh, whatever Israel is doing is, is what's right. Whatever Israel needs them to say, whatever Israel needs them to do, they're willing to do. Whatever they, they need to defend, they're willing to defend. And th it's, it's not a situation where uh, rational argument or engaging with them on the facts or on these talking points is particularly useful or rewarding, I don't think. Uh, and, and that's why you know what Aisha was saying about BDS is important, but I think um, the, one of the most important parts of BDS is the S, is the sanctions, and, and that will take a degree of kind of governmental action. Like this is gonna stop, this current round of attacks is gonna stop when Obama or Kerry makes the phone call, right? Obama's going to make a phone call and say, okay, time's up, this massacre has to end, you've got to stop it, we're facing too much heat here to be able to defend this anymore. That's how these things actually stop. So then the task for us is to create enough heat on them so that they make that call. And so for us here, it's the same thing. The, this, this, this current attack depends on a lot of support from the West. It depends on Canada, it depends on France, it depends on all these countries uh, backing what Israel's doing, the way they have been. Uh, for Israel to stop, 
Um, and not just to stop this attack, but also to open that border, to get that airport, to get that seaport, to get people so that they can actually move, so that the econ economy can function, so that they can rebuild. These politicians, these very ones that are supporting Israel, are going to have to set some limits. And they don't have the kind of, honestly, they don't have the kind of internal ethical compass to do that, that we might hope they have. They only respond to pressure. And so that is the task of everybody here, is to make that happen, is to, is to ensure that there's enough pressure on them that they cannot do the wrong, they cannot continue to do the wrong thing. And what we're facing is reckless, uncompromising hatred from a wide array of actors in our society and, and you know, where these things are, are going on. And so in order to in order to figure out how to act politically in that context, it's important, I think, to be very clear about what we are, what it is that we are actually facing. Um, so, to me, the last thing I'll say about the sanctions part is there is another thing that's trending on Twitter, which is ICC for Israel, the International Criminal Court for Israel. So there are, um, you know, Say, using terms like war crimes or crimes against humanity or genocide, they're all uh, really loaded terms. They're also legal terms. Um, so it's important to use them precisely. But I think that it's fairly clear that war crimes are being committed by Israel here in this case. And, and so this idea of t trying to get Israel before the, the International Criminal Court and preparing evidence for that and preparing a dossier about that is, is an important thing to do. So documenting and, and, and moving that forward is an important thing to do. To do that, you know, the Palestinian Authority would also have to do the right thing. You know, Mahmoud Abbas would have to sign the Rome Statute and, and do certain things that he's been saying he was going to do. That's for the Palestinians though, right? That campaign is for Palestinians to do. What we can do here is work on our political class and in our political climate, um, our, our social media, but also our mainstream media and our politicians, um, our politicians here, uh, in, in order to to put that pressure to set those limits. They're not going to set themselves. This is a, an extremely dangerous, critical situation that is not going to get better by itself. Nobody, nobody in the political class will, will simply be moved to action by seeing, no matter how horrible these images get or how horrible the evidence comes out, nobody, Justin Trudeau or Thomas Mulcair, are not going to say, oh, it's gotten horrible enough now for me to take action. That's not how it works. That's not how politics works. Uh, and, and, and that's not how things are going to go. So when you're thinking about how to, how to move and how to mobilize and what to do, uh, keep all of those things in mind. Um, 